Women's Digital Conference. Woo-hoo. I remember having a conversation with Dr. Brian Sims some eight years ago about this possibility. And so later we created it. And so now we're in the seventh year. My job is easy. My job is just to welcome you. So welcome to this conference. And the theme is 125 years of liberating the black mind. So now I'm going to introduce Ms. King, who will give you the real uh, <laughs> Hello, everybody. We're so excited to um, have you out here with us this morning. Good morning, Aggie, fr- Aggies, friends, and our streaming audience that we have today. My name is Michaela King, and I'm the president of the Psychology Club here at North Carolina A&T. We would like to welcome you all this morning to the 7th Annual Dialogue on Progressive Enlightenment, or also known as DOE Conference. The Dialogue on Progressive Enlightenment Conference represents an effort to foster meaningful interdisciplinary discussion on community enlightenment between individuals. It simultaneously acknowledges that, one, the fundamental responsibility of the individual is to seek out, embrace, and manifest the truth, and two, the burdensome obstacles that the educational institutions often present for African people. Thus, the DOPE mission is to, na- is to use natural human intellectual capital to redefine and refocus the power of educational enlightenment for adaptive, helpful, and vibrant living. Thanks again, and we hope everyone enjoys this day of enlightenment. And I'd also like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Don, Dr. X. Henderson. So, Dr. Don X. Henderson, a.k.a. Professor X., received her PhD in psychology from the North Carolina State from North Carolina State University with a concentration in community psychology. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences at Winston Salem State University. She is a member of the Division 27 Community for Com- Society for Community Research and Access <coughs> Council for Education Programs Outreach Group and recipient of the SCRA Leadership Development Fellowship. She is currently a member of the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Expanding the, the Bench Initiative, recipient of the American Evaluation Association Graduate Education Diversity Fellow, and numerous other awards. Her research focuses on the scholarship of teaching from a social justice framework, community and school-based interventions for suspended students, and resilient processes used to counter used to counter trauma-related events in the public education system among economically disadvantaged ethnic minority adolescents. She continues to write on the challenges black and brown adolescents encounter in the public education system and has written several commentaries for the American Psychological Association, News Observer, and and New American Press. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Don Henderson up here to All right, so good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? All right, so it's an honor to uh, be here, um, to be a part of what I say this dope experience. It's it's kind of sad. I've been at Winston-Salem State for four years, and this is my first time being uh, just in in, in terms of being a part of the the culture and the young people. It also gives me great pride to stare into all of you young people's faces because as the person who is transitioning into the outer realm, <laughs> very excited and, and willing to pass on the baton to our next group of young people. Um, so my particular uh, focus today is the idea of forging counter stories and counter spaces to the lost and turned out um, narrative that we often see among suspended youth. And I want to just give you an overview of my particular presentation because I'm hoping that we can have a little bit of dialogue. Of course, I will share some of my research, but I'm really looking to you as an audience to be engaged as we talk about this discussion on out-of-school suspension, looking at, again, how do we carve out counter stories and counter spaces, and what does that look like for young people? And last but not least, thinking about the ways in which we can share knowledge, share knowledge around this particular issue, and how do we improve educational attainment among young people of color. So I'm really interested in stories. I'll ask you this. Why are stories important? Anyone? Yes. 
that's how our information gets passed down from generation to generation in an easier way. Okay, the ways in which we pass down information from generation to generation. I love that. Yes, sir. Well, that's the way that you don't forget. A way that you don't forget. The constant reminder. Okay? Anybody else? Why are stories so important? We have psychology majors raise your hand. Why do you think stories are so important? Yes. I say, when you hear a story, it's also easy to remember because it's kind of colorful, you know, the character, you know, the scenarios, So stories are easy to remember. Stories help us define our world. Stories help us make meaning. Uh, even though, again, if we think about the historical traditions of psychology has been more in objective measures, all of it is still a story. It's still narrative, right? And so we need stories to help us understand the world, to help us understand meaning. How do we tell our stories? How do we do it? How do we tell our stories? Through oral tradition? Very good. There's some other ways in which we tell our stories. Music? Music. Love it. Oh, research? Research. Love it. Yeah. Dance, love it. <laughs> what are some other ways in which we tell our stories? Art. Huh? Art. Really? Art. Through narratives, right? Through written texts. Through in social media time, we tell our stories through Instagram, right? The <laughs> As my young daughter says, through six to nine second vines, you know, ooh, that's, we done told that story, right? Whatever that particular story is. But I want to ask a question what allows some stories to be told while others are often left aside. Oppression. Oppression. Okay. Yes. Um, I think I guess the privilege of having a a voice that's or I guess a medium to tell your stories. So okay. Some people don't have access to those. So having the privilege, oppression. Anyone else? Fear. Huh? Fear. Fear, so someone's fear, right? Their, their fear that they have within themselves. Anybody else? I would like to say, as a community psychologist, we always use systems language, so I would like to say power. Power and resources. When I have access to power, I can control the ways in which resources, stories, I call them, right? I can decide where they begin. I can decide who this who accesses them, and I can decide how they are disseminated, right? So it's really important for us to think about a counter story. What do you think a counter story is? So we have a story, but now we're going to have a counter story. What is that? Yes. <laughs> the story that opposes the first story. Yes, there you go, there you go. And, and one of the things that you said was, counter stories are stories that tend to defy oppression, right? Mm -hmm. They tend to write outside of the dominant perspective, or they say right from the margins. Because we need counter stories, because what? Why, why do we need counter stories? To stand up for the first story that's so pretty. As a form of power from, right? Yeah. Okay, power to, change, yes. I was going to say, I've always heard it like basically there's always two sides to the corner, two sides to the pancake, or whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, you, you hear the story from this side. It's the same story, but you hear the story from this point of view, and you hear the story from this point of view. They might say like two separate the truth. Separate stories, but it's the same story. Okay, but they also add to the richness, right. right, to our understanding. And if we're talking about empowering ourselves intellectually, it's really important that we think of counter narratives, counter counter stories, okay? All right, so what is space? When you think of space, what comes to mind? The area around you. The area around you, okay, that's cool. Anybody else? Space can be physical, it can be psychological, right? Space can be physical because often uh, we are separating ourselves through like geographic factors, right? Like zone, zip codes, right? We separate ourselves through physical barriers, like this wall. So all of us in this space, we're about to be in power. 
I'm sorry for those folks on the outside, <laughs> right? Space can be psychological because what? We go to our headspace. We use our headspace to reflect, right? Sometimes we, need, we use our headspace to kind of disassociate from our physical space to get some peace sometimes, right? You know, does anybody do that? I know I do. <laughs> Very often, okay? When we talk about space from a, again, someone, the young lady said, I'm a community psychologist, so one of the uh, terms that's coming out of Baker's work is something called behavioral circuit. What do you guys think that means? What is a circuit? It's a circuit. It's a current, right? So it's a flow of energy. So what will we say a behavioral circuit is? Behavioral <laughs> flow of energy, okay? So, so according to Baker, this behavioral flow, the way in which these circuits are wired, often define our norms. They influence the rituals we have. They influence our beliefs. Baker says we need veto curves, circuits. What do you think that means? To veto a circuit. Huh? To bring it back, right? To bring it back? Yeah. It's kind of like to deny. Yeah. Deny, right? So again, we want to think about how can spaces deny what tends to be the norm, right? The beliefs. In a counter space, according to Case and Hunter, 2012-2014, is particularly talking about the space that young people need to access to feel good about themselves, right? If they're in a system that says that you're not going to make it, you're a troublemaker. I'm so tired of you being in my class. That they need to access a counter space, some a space that says you're smart, you're brilliant. You can do this, right? Because what does it do for those young people? It makes them feel a sense of community. It makes them feel connected, right? It makes them feel like, hey, maybe, maybe I'm not so bad, right? Maybe something wrong with them. Maybe I can do well because I have people who feel that I can do well, right? And in this space, I'm countering oppression, right? Because I feel good. I feel good being male. I feel good being Latino. I feel good being Hispanic. I feel good being a woman. I feel good being black. And I need that space, right? I need that space because I have to go and navigate my particular world. So here's the question. What does the story look like? for out of school suspension. This is just your conventional wisdom, your general knowledge. Just tell me what you've heard. Has anybody? Heard of out of school suspension? Yes. Or experience of out of school suspension? That sounds even better. <laughs> <laughs> tell me. It was very isolated. I had nothing but to look there and do my homework. Mm -hmm. My mom took away everything while I was out of school. So isolation. Yeah. OK, very good. Yes. So I was going to say, like, I never but my mom had like a similar thing. She told me, you know, I don't have nothing. But I know the people around me at school, they were like, please give me the only sense so I can sleep in and I don't have to do <laughs> So people are like, please, I, I need that. I, I think of it as a savior. I need to rest. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> What's the story? Yes. I kind of feel like after you've been suspended, I've been suspended before. So, you know, it's like, it feels like a felony charge has been put on you. <laughs> they just look at you now like, oh, he did something, you know, she did something. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Okay, so that feeling, <clears throat> yes. I don't know, when I got OSHA, it was like around five days. They made me go work with other people. That was, <laughs> I ain't gonna say nothing. Okay. <laughs> five days straight. Okay. All right. So this kind of five days straight, this time. Almost right? like a program, I think they call it like. Or something like uh -huh. that. Like, I'm free, why they get suspended for like this over a couple days. Okay, all right, very good to see you in the program. Yes. I think the story with suspension was like more counterproductive. Like, the people who would get suspended, like, for behavioral reasons, they would come back and be behind, you know, so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay, yes, young lady. 
I would say that the story for out of school suspension is pretty biased in my opinion just because the guidelines that a lot of institutions place upon the students are really based on interpretation and how they feel like they should be punished. And I feel like sometimes it can be done unfairly specifically for a marginalized group. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, so I'm going to share with you some stories. I'm going to share with you some stories. Um, can you guys see this in the back? Um, black students are punished more harshly, more frequently than white students for the same offenses. Education interrupted. No funds, but we definitely have funds for our criminal justice system. Closing the school discipline gap. School to prison pipeline. Unequal. This is just rape to student discipline, suspension and dropout, civil rights suspended according to Wilson and Skipper, and out of school and off track. Okay? This is the narrative. This is the stories that we often hear when we're talking about out of school suspension. When we look at the problem of out of school suspension again, the narrative tells us that disproportionately African American students are suspended in comparison to their white counterparts roughly three times. So they have, so they have a three times the more likely chance to get suspended. We know that the, the, the numbers vary. However, when, we, when people, again, in the Civil Rights Report, when they looked at uh, the number of students receiving OSS out of school suspension, they said roughly that group was 70%. 70% of that group were low income. So you mean like, you know, if you're poor, then you, you, you bad? I mean, I'm just saying. Is that what we're saying? Okay. Um, Iceland out of Duke University looked at North Carolina as a state and found that, again, African American students were more frequently, not only were they more frequently <coughs> suspended, but they received harsher discipline. Harsher discipline. So I have one student, well, I'm going to let you go to ISS. I'm going to send you out. You're going to get three, five days. Harsh of And as the young lady said, we understand the risk. So when we are continuously, I want to say continuously, because, you know, as some of you say, well, I've been suspended once. Okay. <laughs> but when we are continuously suspending young people, when you are continuously suspending young people, who are going back to environments where their parents, their families do not have the economic resources for them to be engaged. Where are they going? Anybody? Jail. Well, I hope not. Not yet. Later <laughs> on, that's the pipeline. They're young people. They want to feel connected. They're hanging out in the neighborhood. They're hanging out in their community. If there's no one there to engage them in pro-social behavior, we were all teens once. What's going to happen? What do you think? Oh, you may smoke a little marijuana. You smoke a little, maybe I, I use the, the wrong term, maybe you smoke a little weed. <laughs> you like some young ladies? Maybe you, you know, y'all go off in the spot and, you know, Enjoy each other. Okay? Maybe smoke some cigarettes. Maybe like twiddling their thumbs. I ain't got nothing to do. The house over there looks really nice. Hmm. I saw so and so bringing a TV. I think I, I think I want that. Okay? If you're not engaged in pro social activity, as you said, young lady, if you are continuously suspended, I do not provide an intervention. You said you were in a program, but I do not provide intervention for you. What happens? We already know you're missing school, right? So what happens? It leads to academic gaps. You come back after three or five days, you realize they done already touched on chapter two and three, and your teacher says, well, y'all have a test on Friday. What are you doing? You probably feel a little frustrated. And more than likely, the statistics say that those who tend to be suspended between two or three more times, they're more likely to be re-suspended. Okay? And unfortunately, if you disengage, remember, as a community psychologist, we think about systems. So if I disengage 
from one system. I disengage from the school system. And I do not have other systems like family and community to say, hey, we, we refuse to let you be lost and turned out. We refuse. Then the way our systems are designed is we will engage you in another system. And that system is called the criminal justice system. The school to prison pipeline. So my particular work as a community psychologist, I have to think about how do I focus on prevention, right? So I understand this story, but there, are there some systems in place? Are there some interventions? Are there something that's helping these young people from not continuously to experience the tattooing of being lost and turned out? You know, the tattoo that goes right across the forehead. Or maybe the arm down the neck, okay? Are there interventions in place that allow young people to be resilient, that promote this idea of psychosocial development, their efficacy, their sense of self, right? Their ethnic identity, their identity as young people. Are there systems in place to help them lead to engagement within the education system so that they are graduating, so that they are graduating, going on to college, so that they are graduating, going on to college, and then going on to graduate school, so that they're graduating, going on to college, and becoming PhDs, MDs, right? So that young people themselves can feel empowered, have efficacy, the belief that I can change this, the belief that I can change. So that's what my particular work is, and that's what I hope to share again with you today. So um, I've been doing this work since my, my dissertation actually was around a community-based program. So I've been doing this work for about four and a half years, four and a half years. And I just want to share with you over the four and a half years, I've done um, work around, like as you said, community and school-based interventions. So this is what my young people look like. Um, roughly 63% of the young people that I've interviewed over the past four and a half years are African American and Hispanic. Thank you, I needed that too. 63% <laughs> uh, have been a part of school-based interventions, and majority of them are in middle and high school. And I say that middle and high school is very important. The research is saying that young people actually are getting suspended in pre-K. How many of you knew that? All right. Crazy. Pre-K. They are starting to suspend young children in pre-K, right? And this is where the studies begin. But middle and high school, the research in middle and high school is that it's transition periods. Uh, sixth grade, sixth grade, and ninth grade has the highest rate of suspension. Why do you guys think sixth grade and ninth grade has the highest rates of suspension? They used to be the top dog. Oh, that's an interesting theory. Thank you. No one ever really thought about that. Yes. The transition between different schools. Okay. So the transition, yes. It's a biological transition. Mm -hmm. The mind changes. Mm -hmm. Adolescent brain. Okay, very good. Anybody else? So I, I don't really know, but maybe, you know, you were singing. You graduated? Yes. I'm a junior. Okay. Oh, I was thinking about needing to work together. Okay. <laughs> and 90% of these young people have lived in households whose annual income is less than 50000 a year. Some of you are like, 50000 that's pretty good. But accordingly, um, and again, this is depending on family size, and almost all of these students were more likely to be qualified for free and reduced. So they, if they were not an economically disadvantaged, they may have been an economically fragile household. Okay? Economically fragile household. <clears throat> so what did I want to do today is talk about this counter story. And um, I consider myself a mixed methods person. I use both quantitative and qualitative methodology. But I'm starting to explore more of the qualitative side of myself. Because again, there's, there's something powerful about the story. So what we did was we looked at all of these interviews and tried to see if we can identify 
the ways in which young people were describing these spaces and how often did they describe these um, spaces. So I wanted to share with you some of our preliminary findings. So we looked at this across males and females and looked at these words like achieve and capacity, um, confidence, and anything. So when you look at any of these words, do you think any of these words matter to you? Does love matter to you? What does love do? Let's, let's just, no, we're going to have some dialogue. You know what I mean? I am not a talking head. <laughs> it nourishes you. It nourishes you. It motivates. Motivation. It can motivate you. It encourages you. It encourages you. Right, it encourages up there. Anything else? What does it feel like to achieve? To go somewhere and do well. Huh? A sense of pride. A sense of pride? I love that. Anything else? What does it feel like to go somewhere and something that may have been a struggle when you do it, it's no longer a struggle anymore? What does it do for you? You feel liberated. I love that. You know, it's like that calculus stuff, you know, like, we can't use that like <laughs> You know, like you have that teacher, you don't get it, then you have that teacher who explains it to you, like, dang, this is the best, right? This is, a breakthrough. This is, it's a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough. Right, it's a breakthrough. What about another frequent concept is support? What is support? Let me ask you guys, what does support do for you as college students? Huh? Helps you keep pushing. Resilience. Anybody? She basically said that. It helps you keep pushing. Anything else that it helps you do? It reinforces why you push. Because if you have a constant reminder, someone who says, don't give up. You can do it. And then you internalize that message, right? Don't give up. I can do it. When you have kind of adversity or things that may challenge you, you go back to that space, right? Remember we talked about that headspace? You go back to that message. You go back to that person and you say, okay, don't give up. You know, I can do it, all right? So again, this is just some of the preliminary findings. Um, so another thing too, this was working with, uh, since I've been at Winston-Salem State, undergraduate students, so we coded this data and we looked at the way in which it provided a counter story. So again, if you look up here, um, risk of out of school suspension, low levels of academic engagement, low levels of academic support, we have academic gaps, educational attainment, and involvement in the juvenile justice system. So what, through, the, through my undergraduate students, we identify these themes, these ways in which these spaces, these counter spaces, were providing havens for young suspended students. So a value of focus on education and high school completion, it reoriented youth in their cultural traditions and pride, promoted school engagement, provides academic support, supports their graduation, and deters students from dropping out that these were counter spaces that were deterring young people, again, giving them what? What do we say that they need? Support. Okay. Love. Love So in the tradition of, I heard there's a poetry slam, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So in the tradition of a poetry slam, um, I, I pulled this technique from Dr. Jennifer Green. She's at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and she talks about how can we use data to, to incite or ignite um, visual imagery, emotion. So we use the same narratives of the young people we suspended. And I have two pieces that I want to share with you today to, uh, to, get, to do a poem. A poem. This, these again, these are their words. So our first poem today is called uh, Getting Back on Track. Stay focused because I used to be sidetracked a lot. I got to stay focused. 
keep doing what you're doing, just be good. Try to do good because you want to get out and just like, just let stuff go. You got to do work. You don't want to, but I got to. Being good, that stands out. Everybody has a dream. Everybody has a dream. And no one wants to end up in prison. Stay out of trouble. That's what I leave with. Help anybody. Get anybody where they want. You can further your education. It Changed Me is a group program to help students get back on the right track. And this is coming from Alternative Learning Centers uh, in Winston-Salem, Forsyth County Schools. So get back on track, okay? Next piece called the boomerang effect. What is the boomerang? It brings you right back, right? Like that village. So this is a student talking about their experience in school. Sit down. Do this. Don't do that. No break for you. I got suspended. Someone says, do you need some help? They make you feel special. They don't make you feel bad. They help you out and help you control your anger. They make me feel special. It is a good feeling inside. Special. You are welcome here. Finish your work, you just gotta be focused on your work. Now I do better in school. It's like a good feeling inside, getting my studies done. Now I want to finish school. It is a good place to go, give you a chance to turn your life around. The boomerang effect, okay? Can we get more boomerang effects? Excellent. So what does the counter story look like to out of school suspension? What do you think? We already said what the story looks like. What does the counter story look like? Throw out some terms, some words. <coughs> if we are creating a counter story to out of school suspension, if we're saying we no longer are going to have people continue to tattoo on the minds of young people lost and turned out, then what does it look like? Love. Love, support, support, achievement, encouragement, encouragement, determination. determination. Anything else? I say it's diplomas. I say it's youth empowerment. I say it's education and attainment. I say it's every Hispanic student succeeding. I say it's academic success for African American students. It's youth engagement. It's equity. It's young, gifted, and black. It's what? Moving young people through the education pipeline. It is walking, it's standing in a crowd and watching a young person don their gown and be empowered. And not don the gown of, I graduated from high school. Don the gown because I'm doctor now. We need champions. This is my call to you all. We need champions for a new story. We need people who are willing to take their voices into critical spaces for change in the criminal justice system, in the education system, in higher education, in health. We need to counter the narrative to this deficit perspective. Low educational attainment, High rates of suspension. The achievement gap. We need counter stories. We, re we need to reorient our prevention back to the collectivist framework and the power of the village. That it really does take a village. We cannot rely on just the school system. We need to build the capacity of our families. We need to build the capacity of our community. That's the only way. We've been talking about this since roughly 1967. How many years ago was that? 40 plus years. Are we going to continue to talk about this 40 more years? And then 40 more years. Who knows? You know, I don't even know if you know, the earth is working on herself. So what? <laughs> <laughs> so we have to think about that. But we need champions for a new story. I want to acknowledge in closing my soldiers, and these are, again, these are what I call people who have boots on the ground, people who 
continue to advocate for young people. Uh, Dr. Glenn Johnson Green is with Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. Tammy Pfeiffer, she's the director of the Boomerang Program in uh, Chapel Hill. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that must be my club. <laughs> I want to acknowledge uh, the research assistants I've had, uh, Andrea Lewis, Jasmine Davis, Mona Zahir, and Kadena Dawson. Um, I want to acknowledge the Society for Community Research and Action and the Research Initiative Program at Winston-Salem State University for helping to fund some of this work. And this is, you know, I'm not here to kind of toot my horn, but uh, it's, it's me saying, remember that story I said about young people? You know, I, I was the uh, elementary and middle school kid who kept getting suspended. And my village said, uh-uh, we can go unless you do that, okay? So I use my privilege as a doctor to write, to write research. Someone said a story is research, to do the research, to write the counter stories that needs to be written, to say, uh-uh, we need interventions. This is how it can work, right? This is how we can help save young people, okay? So again, I'm just using myself to say, we need more writers, researchers, within this field. And thank you so much. So I believe we're opening the floor for questions and answers. Okay. Yes. So um, when you observe the programs, from your observations, what were the pivotal key ingredients that you feel like mattered? Um, I think, I'm going to try to summarize that. That's a really good question. Number one is the initial sense of connectedness has to happen. Um, when young people, again, when they're suspended, it, it, you're disconnecting a, a very valuable relationship. And so one of the things that I observed actually in the Boomerang program, the first thing that they do after they have them fill out paperwork, they do something called the tree activity. And the tree activity, every student had to draw their tree. And in their roots of the tree was kind of like their um, challenges. Right? But then in the leaves, they have to draw their aspirations, their goals, their dreams. And I saw how staff would engage in young people. And kind of that process, that initial process, I think was powerful, right? So that initial sense of connectedness. Um, the other thing, too, that I felt was highly important, and I talk about this, um, is the sense of autonomy. I think um, one of the things that we found is that Young people talk about how the school system kind of uh, severs this idea of autonomy. And autonomy, everybody knows that, right? So it kind of promotes docility. So when you come into a space and someone says, what would you like to do today? Something as basic as that? It's like, you're asking me? You sure? So that, that sense of autonomy is very um, valuable. The other thing is the relationship with a, an adult advocate that young people, <laughs> despite what people, you know, some people say, I can do it by myself. Young people need an adult advocate. They need somebody they can continue to return to. And in the Boomerang program and also in, in the centers, the young people talked about, if I'm angry, I can go back to so-and-so and they'll make me feel good. If this teacher got on my nerve, I call on so-and-so. And they just make me feel good. So the value of the adult relationship, the adult relationship, really, really is significant. Any other questions? Yes. Good morning. Um, my name is Nigel Walden, and I'm a senior psychology student. And my question to you is kind of to go back on your own stuff when you said having researchers that do more culturally inclusive research. When it comes to the realm of psychology, what do you think needs to be done to promote more education reformation? Because there are a lot of people within a lot of cultures that do a lot of research that focuses on educational attainment, mm -hmm. and a lot of it focuses on the disadvantages of black students and Latino students and things like that. So what do you think needs to be done in order to improve that and move communities 
psychology into a realm where we're including the needs of these kids yes. rather than focusing on their disadvantages. On their disadvantages. Um, that's a very difficult question because I'm struggling with that myself. I'm just, I really think that it goes back to like Esther's idea about storytelling. If we don't have enough people leveraging these spaces, like if we don't have people coming from communities talking about community, these communities, you know, if we don't have these people, and I'm saying like, if we don't have women at the table, if we don't have Latino, Hispanic, you know, Chicano at the table, if we don't have African people at the table, then we're continuously relying on someone to tell our story. And I really do think that we need to be at the table first, number one. The second thing is we are in a fighting a tradition of looking at deficits. And as a community psychologist, our framework is from a strength-based, asset-based perspective. It is a cultural shift. You're trying to shift the way people think. And that is very difficult. Because you have to tell somebody, I understand you do not have this and this and that, but what are your assets? And it's very difficult when we're talking about a culture just in our society. Come on, just think about yourselves. How often do we tell each other, you are so awesome? How often, just think about it, how often do we engage in systems that say, it's all right to be this size, this size, and this size, because it's beautiful. We're, we're part of a larger system that continuously challenges just us as individuals and continuously diminishes anything that's outside of the prototype. You know, whether we're talking about body, whether we're talking about hair, whether we're talking about class, whether we're talking about orientation, ability, all those different things. So I really think, again, we need to find um, pathways to continue to promote young people moving through the pipeline, being a part of the table. And I think it's just a fight. It's, it's a constant battle. But I think that's a great question. Thank and I don't know if I answered that. You did. Thank okay. You. <laughs> I wanted to add to that, that yes. statement because the idea about, uh, about counter-narrative, it's, kind of, it's, it's a quasi-question statement. Mm -hmm. So we talk about a counter-narrative, it, it is in opposition to something. And, mm -hmm. and fundamentally, I have to understand that the original original narrative actually may be based on a falsehood, yes. right? Which would, then, which would increase the system of individuals being uh, uh, incarcerated in school through suspension. Mm -hmm. So the, the thinking for me is this idea of a corrective narrative that mm -hmm. when I tell my fundamental truth, is, it is a correction to your misperception of who I really am, yes, yes, right? Yes. So so the question seems to be, but well, how do we promote corrective narrative expressions, right? Mm -hmm. So then there is a competition with your distorted narrative is based on your uh, misunderstanding of what I really am. So how do we how do we look at that psychology? Because we do have this deficit model, mm -hmm. uh, looking at uh, other folks. But, but again, it's, it's Europeans looking at the other right. is always a deficit. But the corrective narrative says that I am I am imbued with power. Here's my authentic voice, mm -hmm. and so as a, as a, and not in response to, but uh, as, as an expression of my authenticity. Here is how I position myself. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a strength-based model, mm -hmm. right, for looking at uh, uh, black folks specifically, mm -hmm. and then Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, that's, I'm going to stop with that one, because that's right. <laughs> the the strength-based model yeah. uh, idea. Yes. yes. So what your thoughts about strength-based work? And um, so, so again, you know, I, I think this also comes down to who you are as a person. Um, I made a commitment to work at a historically black institution when I left North Carolina State University. And I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because I had just finished my PhD in community psychology. And I said, I want to spread the doctrine of community psychology. And I've had to challenge myself as someone who teaches. How do I just teach from? Not um, regurgitating, oh, these students don't write like they used to, right? Oh, these students are just not smart like they used to. Back in my day, they just don't want to learn, you know? I had to challenge myself that and say, every time I step in the classroom, I have to look at everybody's if they have strengths, right? Every time I get that message, whether it's from my colleagues, whether it's from, again, society, I have to like, stop the message from kind of 
permeating my brain cells. And I just flip it, you know, and say, no, nope, that's not these young people. That's not these young people. So, so but that's me. And I, again, how do you ingrain that in people? Because that's kind of just something that sits at the core of myself, you know? How do, how do we do that? How do we create, you know, that, that kind of passion and that desire, I guess, in, in individuals? <laughs> yes. I think one way maybe looking at the at their culture and understanding it a little bit more mm -hmm. of what motivates them and, mm -hmm. and where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Because even from one region of North Carolina, mm -hmm. the western part to the eastern part, mm -hmm. you have different cultures. Yeah. And it's different things that motivate them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So looking from the cultural perspective. Yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Robinson. Yes. How do you explain the racial disparity in OSS? How do you explain the racial disparity in out-of-school students? Okay, so there is a huge body of work uh, for <coughs> UIBU. Um, there is uh, work that's coming out of, uh, I think it's Okiki okay, 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 okay and colleagues in 2012. They looked at um, teacher behaviors across schools, and they found that, again, it was off the orientation of teachers. So teachers were actually misinterpreting body language. So the body language of, uh, in this case, African American students was perceived in a very <coughs> adversarial way. And because of the way in which the body language was perceived, then they were more likely to say, well, that kid was being disrespectful. So I think that there's a body of work talking about teacher orientation. Um, there's also looking at the discretionary practices in terms of the administrators. So assistant principals are actually the ones here in North Carolina that make the recommendation for a student to be suspended. And they found that oftentimes, again, assistant principals will use what they call mitigating circumstances. So they may say, oh, you know, let's say they, they did something, they had a school offense in ninth grade. A assistant principal would then pull up, let's say it's disrespect, will pull up their whole academic record and say, you know, you've been disrespectful, you got suspended or whatever, I think I'm going to have to suspend you. So they use kind of these discretionary practices to determine who gets an out-of-school suspension or not. Um, again, I know with um, some colleagues and I, we looked at the politicalization of, uh, of uh, zero tolerance. So zero tolerance was in response to mass school shootings that was happening. However, zero tolerance policy did not affect those who were com committing those kinds of crimes. Um, when you look at mass school shootings, particularly um, what was happening in the 90s, these were majority white males. The nation uh, put forth zero tolerance policies. They uh, connected <coughs> funding, so states had to pass zero tolerance policies in order to get funding from the U.S. Department of Education. And the zero tolerance policies did not punish those who were committing those kinds of crimes. It actually, as we know, disproportionately punished kids of color. And in fact, the, the research, again, Carpenter Ramirez talked about the suspension was not even violent related suspensions. There were non-violent suspensions. So kids were being suspended for excessive noise, not being in what dress code violation, insubordination, disrespect, and this was, again, disproportionately affecting kids of color. We already talked about body language. So I think that there are a number of factors that uh, influence out-of-school suspension. There's a body of literature around that. Um, you know, I'm just coming from what I know, my particular resource. Okay, that's it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we've got to get ready for the next speaker. But I'm, I'm